Hospital Limited, the manager of Myopia Management Center. He is a professor in Centro Escobar University School of Optometry and a resource speaker. This person is such a charismatic individual. Don't, wouldn't you say, Dr. Romeo, from knowing this speaker of ours? Of course, he is. Look at yeah. him now. Um, uh, he's, he's a very enthusiastic speaker, and I'm speaking out of my own experience. He was my professor before. And we are so grateful for his presence among us today. And without further ado, I would want to welcome Dr. Rajai Soryan. Hi, Dr. Rajai. Good afternoon, good afternoon, everyone. Can you hear me, guys? Yes, loud and clear, Doc, loud and clear. There you go. Uh, good you afternoon, go. Doc Cole. Good afternoon, Doc Romeo. Looking good as ever. All right, can you see my screen now? There, we can see your screen now, Doc. Okay. Again, uh, it's an honor and a great joy to be able to present to you today the 21 visual steps. Um, as you can see, there's a talk going on saying the 21 visual steps really old school and it's only for old people. Others are saying it's just 21 point is from time long ago. Others are saying it has been long ignored and it's no longer taught. Others are saying they came up with a faster way of coming up with data and, uh, data. and um, others are saying it's about time to revisit 21 step that's why we are here but you know as as any uh, good movie series it's always nice to go back so that's what we are going to do now so let me start so this is an overview of the 21 visual steps as we all know so I will go through the procedures uh, one by one but some of them will be just in passing because I'm sure you already know it down to a T so um, let me jump right into it so this is uh, actually these are the tests that I'm sure you already know so let's get on with it so first is ophthalmoscopy which is very very important because this determines the presence or absence of pathology Next is, of course, the keratometry, which is your VT number. Sorry about that. VT number two. We know that a keratometer is no longer used, maybe obsolete, but, you know, we have highly sophisticated um, instruments now, like we have uh, Keratograph 5 or uh, a Shineflow uh, Pentacam that can uh, measure and assess curvature, power, and thoracity of the cornea. Next, of course, is the static retinoscopy, wherein this is also known as your objective refraction. Ob objectively, we can determine the error of refraction of our patient. Next is the dynamic retinoscopy at 20. As we all know, this is the objective way of determining the near visual problem. And also, we have dynamic retinoscopy at 40, wherein um, this again objectively determines the visual problem of uh, the intermediate problem of the patients so of course this one this is already um probably the the thing that everyone knows to a t this is your subjective refraction and i'm sure that you have technique that can never be questions for you definitely know this by heart and uh let me jump now to ferometry test as you can see here the ferometry is divided into two. We have far and the near. Um, but mind you, that's, uh, uh, that's the thing I, I need you to understand, that the tests are divided into two, though the procedures are exactly the same. Let me say that again. The procedures exactly the same. So whatever you do at far, you will just do at near. So it's going to be a little bit... Uh, repetitive if I discuss that over and over so what I'm going to do is just uh, cluster them together knowing that the same procedure uh, actually will have the same video later on as I present it so here we go first is uh, VT3 or also known as the habitual foria at far this is the test wherein you determine the presence of foria with your patient having their old rx or their uh, um <clears throat> eyeglasses on <clears throat> excuse me i need water <clears throat> we are so live anyways so what you do here when the patient comes in you might want to check 
uh, the condition of the eye. So with the old RX, again, with the old RX, by placing, again, by placing um, two uh, prisms. We have the dissociating prism over OS, which is your 6% base up, and a measuring prism, 12 prism base in over OD. So you, you will instruct your patient, you will instruct your patient, excuse me, thank you. You will instruct your patient to report to you once vertical alignment is achieved. So all you got to do is make sure that your patient understands that. So how does it look? It's just like the button of a shirt. So as you can see, the button are vertically aligned. Once this happens, make sure that the patient um, responds well. And, and that's what you are to look for. So for recording, prism base in is recorded as exo. Remaining base out is iso and zero is ortho. Expected value is 0.5 or half exo. So as you would notice, for induced for you, the only difference is the lens in place. Earlier, I have mentioned about habitual, it's your old RX or the RX of the patient as he or she came into your clinic. So now you are to use your manifest, your subjective, your new RX as a lens in place. But the procedure is exactly the same. Same with 13A which is only done at near. This is your habitual foria at near, which is your 13A. Um, the difference is the distance. Earlier, it was done at 20 feet. Now, it, it is at 16 inches or 40 cm. Next, the 13B, instead of using the old RX, you are using now your manifest refraction or your near correction. Now, you would notice for the expected value, it's 6 exo. Okay, so this is how it is. So um, if you can see my video. So first, I will put the measuring prism in dissociating, starting with dissociating, which is six prism base up over OS. There you go. And then um, over OD, of course, you will put uh, a prism, 12 prism base in. So you have to put the zero at 12. And then towards the nose is the base in. So you go 12 and then reduce the base in until the patient reports vertical alignment. And that is your VT38, 13A, 13B. So we now move to VT9, which is, you might want to remember this as the only VT with the true in, in, this, in its title. So it's a lot easier that way. I would always tell my students that. And also maybe by the uh, expected value, VT9, 7 to 9 is the expected value. Now what happens here, this is the only test that uses auxiliary lens of, of plus 25 diopter. So this is to demonstrate the blur that you are to ask the patient to remember. As you remove this and place uh, the prism, um, ready to turn base out okay and this one is continuous to vt10 because um this is a, a continuous test 9 and 10 are done together so vt10 is the test we're in after doing vt9 which is ready to turn base out you would uh, push it more out until the patient says there's doubling now as soon as there's doubling um, go back until uh, there's recovery or singling of the image. Now, um, this is also, as I mentioned, um, the equi equivalent for near is actually the 16A. So others are saying um, the 9 is also a positive relative only for near. And then we also have our 16B, which is similar to our VT10. Um, so others are calling VT10 as positive fictional reserve. So exactly the same procedure. Um, I'm going to show you how it's done. So ready to turn position 0 at 12. OU, ready to turn base out. Blur first for your VT9. And then break for your VT10. And recover for... Um, the recording for VT10, break over recovery. There you go. 
Next is VT11. Now, it's a lot easier to probably remember VT11 as the abduction at far. Um, this one is the opposite of VT10. If uh, the orientation for VT10, VT10 is um, prism ready to turn base out, now we are going in, ready to turn base in. That's making the ice um, go out. So as you can see here, um, the expected value now is a 9 over 5 break over recovery. So we have a counterpart, as I mentioned. You would notice, though, that when far, you would not have the blurring. For the reason this is done at far and the eyes are divergent. But when you do it at near, at 17A, because of the test distance, it's moved closer to 16 inches. Therefore, accommodation takes place. That's why there's blurring. So 17A is your blurring, which is your negative relative convergence. So similar thing, ready to turn base in for the blur followed by 17D, which is your break recovery. I'll show you how it's done. As you can see, now we are going ready to turn base in. So first is to blur for 17A and then break recovery for VT11 and 17B. So that's how you record it. Next, we have, of course, the other um, significant parametry test, such as uh, the following. So let me uh, jump right into it. So 14A is also known as dissociated. Other texts would say it's monocular, maybe because of the design of the foropter head. Because back in the days, foropter heads were designed with separate prism. Uh, and uh, the Jackson cross cylinder wherein you can utilize both at the same time but with the new design it's either or it's either you use a Jackson cross cylinder or you use a prism that's why it's already done monocularly others they call it unfused cross cylinder but they're all the same so what you do now is by using a Jackson cross cylinder red dot at 90 um, you place that you can do that monocularly and then introduce plus lenses until um, vertical alignment, uh, vertical uh, lines are darker. Now, before you ask that, you might say, um, maybe you can check if uh, the before placing the Jackson cross cylinder, if if the horizontal and vertical are equally clear, then you may proceed by adding plus lenses to make the vertical lines darker. Now, as you do that, all you gotta do, as soon as it's darker, or you can do sudden fog by placing plus one diopter uh, to make the vertical darker, and then slowly reduce that plus until equality is achieved. Let me show you how it's done. Okay, here we go. All right, first, you increase the plus until vertical alignment is achieved. Or you may do that by sudden fog, as I've mentioned. So here, as you can see, I am increasing the plus until vertical lines are darker. Okay, and then what you do next is you reduce that plus until vertical uh, vertical and horizontal are equal but just in case equality is not achieved make sure to make the vertical line darker such as this one there you go so next one is um, uh, next one is 15a which is induced for you um this is uh, similar to your FOIA test that near the only difference is whatever is your finding through your 14A, we will now perform um, the FOIA test at near. So it's like simply doing the same procedure as you did for your 13B. So let me show you how it's done. There you go, as, uh, as I've shown you earlier, Six prism base up over OS and 12 prism base in over OD. So exactly the same whenever you do your uh, FOIA tests at near. 
okay so this one would be vertical alignment asking for vertical alignment but only through 14a findings okay so there you go next we have the associated or binocular or few cylinder cross uh, cross cylinder test or at near or um what we are looking at is based on monocular this is just as simple as using binocular so now you won't be need, you won't be needing a prism just in case you're using an old ferropter but uh, just use the jackson cross cylinder still red dot at 90 and just perform similar to your 14a the only difference is as you put plus lenses making the vertical line you would reduce the uh, plus uh, plus lenses until equality is achieved but when equality is not achieved leave the horizontal darker i'll show you how it's done as you can see red dot at 90 and then um it's the same way when, when you do your VT14A, only this is done binocularly. Next is the 15B, which is, again, your Fourier test at near. Only the difference is this is through your 14B finding. Whatever is your finding in your 14B, you will do the Fourier test once again. Next, I'm sure everyone knows uh, VT19, also known as the amplitude of accommodation. Now, the thing that you need to remember about VT19 is um, you have a press biop and a non press biop patients. So, for non press biop patients, you are to use a minus lens. Again, it's a minus lens for non press biop, and for, for press biop, a plus lens for uh, a very logical reason. If you give uh, a minus lens to a press bio definitely they're not gonna see the target so just a uh, heads up for sure you remember this so what you do is um, as I would show you the video this is how it's done so our patient here is actually our example is a non press bio so I am to place a minus lens I will increase minus lens until difficulty uh, in reading the target so that's the end point or others are saying total blur or simply difficulty in reading. So I would uh, do it uh, monocularly. And then after doing monocularly, you can do binocularly. So I would increase minus lens. As you can see, um, I would ask the patient if it's still clear. And then until, the, until such time, the patient can no longer uh, see it clear or having difficulty in reading, I would stop and I would record. Recording is as simple as total minus added um, minus um, 250. Sorry, sorry, it's TMA plus 250. For TPA, if you're doing for press biop, um, TPA minus 250. So that's how you record that. Next, of course, is VT20, the positive relative accommodation, wherein this is done binocularly by adding um, minus lenses to stimulate accommodation. Now, this is an interplay of accommodation conversions. So as you put um, your minus lenses, your endpoint is the first blur. As soon as it blurs, um, you might want to stop and then go back as it clears. So that is your accommodation. So what you might want to do also is as soon as it blurs binocularly, occlude one eye. If the patient says it's still blurred, then that is your accommodation. But if it clears, it means it's the convergence that make that made that blurry. Okay. So again, um, you might want to see it. So it's like this. I would introduce minus here to uh, stimulate accommodation until first blur and then again as i've mentioned once blur is achieved you might want to occlude one eye and ask is it still blurry if the patients know it became clear it only proves that convergence made it uh blurry so you might want to add more to make uh to make the accommodation active on that part so 
Next is the negative relative accommodation. For negative relative accommodation, it's just the opposite of 20, which is instead of uh, placing minus lens, you place a plus lens. So plus lens until first blur. So what you do now is, uh, again, just the opposite of uh, what I did for 20. I would now uh, place a plus lens to blur. And then you might want to do the same thing. As soon as the patient says blur, you might want to occlude one eye and tell uh, and ask the patient, is it still blurry? If the patient says it's blurry, then you are done. If the patient says, no, it became clear, definitely it's the convergence that took place earlier. So you might want to add some more. So, and of course, there you go. And of course we have this following test. The reason why it's at the end, because um, this is the rarest uh, situation or cases, which is a vertical foria. Okay, so for uh, VT12, it's divided into two. You have uh, your vertical foria, and uh, 12B is duction, both at far, with for near is 18, which is, again, as I mentioned, if you do things at far, you're, you'll definitely do it at near. So the only difference is, is the distance for this case. All right, so let me jump right into 12 and then 18 because they're basically the same. So this is how it looks. So now you make your dissociating, which is the 6% to become your measuring. So as I mentioned, instead of using um, your six prism base up as a dissociating for vertical for you, it becomes your measuring. Okay, so next we have the 12B, which is the duction together with um, VT18, uh, which is only done at near. So what you do now is um, you do this monocularly, zero at three o'clock or nine o'clock, ready to turn base up and base down. As you go base up, the image goes down, therefore you're doing infraduction. If you do base down, therefore you're doing subproduction. Break recovery, I'll show you how it's done. There you go. And we have come to the end game now. Thank you very much, Doc Cole, Doc Romeo.